Hello, hello everyone, and welcome back for another RGB RPG's DM Prep Guide. Today we're going to be looking at Candlekeep Mysteries. This will be the fifth session of our playthrough. And as always, there's going to be a lot of spoilers ahead for this adventure. So if you are a player in this game or plan on being a player, please click away. But if you are a DM who would like some added insight into how another DM may run this adventure, stick around and check this out. So, we're going to be leaving Candlekeep again today. And we're going to be checking out the Book of the Raven, or we'll be starting the Book of the Raven adventure, and more so tackling the contents of this map here. Um, the book itself does not give any details into this map, and one of my big pet peeves is that I had a lot of trouble finding a good geographical location on the Sword Coast to drop this, but I ended up just kind of picking a spot and going with it. And after that, it's kind of up to the DM if you want to use this map and have it be a real aspect of how the of how the session is run, you have to flesh out these locations. Which way? The Hand and Horn, Three Tree Hill, the Bridge, the Crater, and of course, the end is already done for you at the Chalet for Antifacts. Um, I chose to go with three of these locations and flesh those out and leave the other two just to be kind of a landmark, kind of just how it is there. So the Witch Way is one of them, and so is the Wood Bridge and the Scorch of the Red Worm. Um, those are the places that my, care, my players kind of latched onto a little bit, especially the Scorch of the Red Worm. Everyone was super interested in that. So yeah, so that's going to be mainly this session. The players going to the location that I dropped this into, which just so happens to be Silvery Moon. I chose that area because one of my players has a desire to learn more about the Drow, and Menzo Baron's on being right there, Silvery Moon being so close to it. I figured there would be a lot of people there who could help them figure out more about their more about this desire to learn about the drow and um of course we'll we'll have to do an introduction to people who have met drizzed do urden having been at silvery moon um it'll be kind of a nice little contrast especially i know a couple of my players have read through the ari salvatore books so it'll be a nice little easter egg for them um, meeting people that have met drizzed also be a little bit of a gauge to see just how much of the DD pop culture i want to add into this if they seem to really latch onto that and really enjoy it uh, there's so much that can be added in so yeah we're sending them up to silvery moon we gave them access to candle keeps teleportation circles i kind of took that idea from storm king's thunder that the more powerful organizations of the sword coast have these um, teleportation circles that they can use to just kind of send people wherever they need to go so since the harpers have one i figured it only made sense that candle keep had one as well or access to some so, they will use the teleportation circle to head up to Silvery Moon, and from there, they're going to be basically looking for which way, the town that they know is the starting location of their, um, of the map. Um, any questions about, um, the contact that Alistair has for learning about the drow, um, any contact for Aristina Silverhand? Um, asking about her is going to reveal that she is away at the time. She is expected back in a 10-day, and that's kind of just like the nudge to, hey, do the adventure first, and then we come back, you can have this information. Um, so yeah, she won't be there, but they will meet Leoleth Cedarguard. Um, she is a teacher. She is essentially the, the contact to Candlekeep in Silvery Moon, their most direct contact. She'll be expecting the party when they arrive. She'll introduce Silvery Moon, show them around, tell them the lore and kind of give them the rundown, the lay of the land and whatnot. And um, as we are a player down today, if um, she, if the cart party does ask, Leolith will accompany them and she is using the mage stat block. So she does have something to bring to combat. So yeah, so just a little, if you want the extra help, it's there and the introduction to Silvery Moon. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We do have a lot more fleshed out for the characters now, especially for Alistair and a couple of the others. Um, Uskar just gave me a really great backstory that I haven't gotten a chance to add into this yet, but we are really going to have a lot to work with with uh, Uskar as well. And uh, moving forward, seems like we're going to be getting a lot more backstory from everybody in general. So the session starts, did not change that, the session starts with the players about to depart from Candlekeep to Silvery Moon. Um, Players prepare to depart for Silvery Moon. So, so Silvery Moon. I can type, I swear. Alright, so they'll be preparing to depart for Silvery Moon. Um, 
I want to have, I completely forgot, or we just didn't get around to adding the, uh, the groundskeeper, the gardener in last session. Um, things actually moved really quickly. There wasn't really any slowing down in the whole interaction at Candlekeep. So as they're preparing to leave, I want Dennis, that furbolg that got hit with the game, wants it to show up and um, to have that whole interaction. But from there on, players go to Silvery Moon. Um, if Alistair is attempting to wear any sort of disguises, I am strongly leaning towards having that disguise um, pulled when they arrive. I'm going to hint at that, that um, Silvery Moon is a place where magical effects tend to end almost immediately upon entering. Um, I want to gauge Alistair's player's reaction to that, because obviously if that's not something that they're comfortable with happening to their character, having disguises removed from them, um, we won't go for that. So I'm going to bring that up and um, kind of just hint at that's a possibility that might happen, that there's um, a possibility that magical disguises will be torn from them. Um, if that does seem to be a triggering issue, we will of course move away from that and not do that, and possibly have one of the NPCs hint that they can see through it instead of having it just be a flat, this is gone when you get to Silvery Moon. Um, so yeah, just some notes about Silvery Moon in general. Candlekeep represents accumulation of knowledge for its own sake, while Silvery Moon focuses more on the inherent honor and um, inherent nobleness of the pursuit of knowledge and information. Um, people at Silvery Moon are just in Alistair and tell them stories of how they met Drizzt. Um, the historians there are going to be who can direct them directly to which way, um, to that place. And they're also going to be able to warn them to be careful in that area. Shadow crossings have been spontaneously erupting from the area. And they do not know this yet. Nobody at Silvery Moon knows this yet. But the reason for this is because of the open shadow crossing at Chalet Brandt effects. So the players heading there and closing that shadow crossing, or at least dealing with it, will also have arching effects around the area, further increasing their renown and their standing with higher ups throughout the Sword Coast. The people of Silvery Moon will be very grateful that these shadow crossings are going to stop soon. So we have a few different encounters set up for the maps journey to Chalet Brandt effects, especially since we're down a player today, I really decided to flesh out some of these locations and make just straight up encounters in them. Um, I don't want the missing player to miss out on too much of the plot, any of the story, so I do expect that once they leave Silvery Moon, we are just going to have a lot of um, on-the-map encounters. Of course, that may not be the case, and they may get all the way to Chalet Brandt effects today, but, just in, but I do really expect them to just follow the map for today. So, the town of which way? Um... It is going to be a creepy place, dark, gloomy, completely abandoned, and has been for some time. The reason for this is because of an intermittent shadow crossing that pops up in their town well. Um, the town guard, the fighting force of which way, um, is all that is currently left in the town, and they are not exactly what they once were. They are undead manifestations of what they once were. So we're going to have six skeletons and one revenant on a warhorse. Now, the revenant on the warhorse is going to be very dangerous for a party of level three characters. Um, six of them, plus a potential um, ally to go with them, is going to be relatively easy. Even though we are keeping one of those player, one of those characters, out of the fray because their player won't be here today. Um, dangerous encounter, but the players may be able to talk to them. Um, the Revenant is not beyond reason. They are angry that their town was abandoned, that they were overrun by the undead, and he does not fully understand that he is undead. He sees himself as still protecting the town, and as players come in, they are intruders into his place that he is fighting to his last to defend. If the players can convince him that they mean no harm and in fact mean to help the town. Okay, so if the players do intend to try and talk to this Revenant, um, if they can convince him that they mean no harm, that they mean to help the town, then he may be convinced to call off his attack and um, if it looks like the Revenant and these skeletons are about to get the better of the party, he will start um, speaking in a way that will telegraph to the players that they can talk to him if they try to. Then we get to the... Bridge would be the next location that I have fleshed out. Super simple, classic encounter. A couple of trolls are at the bridge. Fun combat encounter, especially for some of the newer players that may not have actually had a chance to fight a troll before. Um, super scary. Terrifying to see the things that happen when you're fighting a troll. 
Um, and then the Scorch of the Red Worm is a super interesting one. I am going to set that up as a place where two ancient dragons fought each other to their mutual demise. Um, a red and a black ancient dragon fought in this in this location, and their remains litter the area. Their bones are in a pile at the base of this massive crater that they created. Um, so yeah, the encounter about this is there is a young black dragon, the spawn of that former, of that now deceased black dragon, still remains in this place, and jealously guards what's remaining of the treasure there. Most of it was melted to slag in the attack, but there is still some there, and this little black dragon has decided that it is his horde now, and he will guard it jealously. Very deadly encounter, of course. Um, these, the young black dragon is a CR7, I believe. For a party of 5 to 6 CR3 players, this is a dangerous encounter. Um, technically not deadly, but of course that breath weapon and a very high roll could one-off one of the players. So something to be aware of and something to be very careful. Um, any player that goes into this and can see that there's a potential of a black dragon being there, of any dragon being there, is going to be wary. And it's entirely possible the players will run, in which case the black dragon may let them depart or chase them for a bit and then leave them. Um, so, see what the players want to do. See how things go. If things are looking too bleak, then um, they may disengage from this encounter or the black dragon may begin toying with them, offering them his mercy in exchange for their servitude, as black dragons tend to do. Um, the black dragon would much rather humiliate and... Um, and trap the players than just kill and eat them. So yeah, um, no other landmarks hold any major any major um, hints for the players. It's just geographical locations that can point them in the right direction. Um, if any player really latches on to any of the locations, like the Three Tree Hill or the Hand and Horn, um, we may just set up a, a narrative or a roleplay encounter for them there on the fly. That's always a possibility, so always something to be prepared for. Um, the NPCs in this one, uh, we have Dennis, the Furble Gardener, and Lalith, Cedar Guard. Aristina is not likely to come into play today, um, but just in case they inquire more about her, they have some general information. I have some general information that I can share with the party. We have Silvery Moon, the Gem of the North. Um, it is a beautiful elven city, big time Rivendell vibes, except this isn't a city of only elves. This is a very diverse city, while elves do make up the majority of the population here. There are um, all races represented in this area, and all are welcome here. Furthermore, um, there's a great bridge of force that spans the that spans the river separating the city. We have uh, some cool art here to show the party of that as well, just to get the uh, the look at the moon bridge and just set the vibe for this. And yeah, we'll spend a little bit of time at Candle Keep, then move on. But our relevant stat blocks we have for today are, of course, the Revenant on a Skeletal Warhorse. That is going to be extraordinarily dangerous. Super fun to run. Uh, mounted Combat is always super fun. And I kind of like reminding players that Mounted Combat is a thing and that you can mount a horse and enemies can ride mounts as well. And the added dimension to combat by mounted enemies and players is just great because you have so much more movement available to you. And of course, we have the Skeletons. Backing up this to the uh, Revenant, there is the Trolls and the Young Black Dragon. Um, I did a lot of tests on the Young Black Dragon, especially its breath weapon, to make to see just how dangerous this was going to be. And the possibility of it one-shotting a character is high. So it's one of those situations where you really have to look at the situation and see who the target is going to be. Um, it is a line, so the likelihood of it catching everybody like it would with a cone is low to none. I mean, if everybody just lines up in a straight line when they know this is where dragons are hanging out, that's just poor planning. So um, at that point, they kind of walked into whatever is going to happen. Um, but the, it is a line, and so it's likely to only hit one or two characters. If it does get an immensely high roll, I do have to be prepared for the you are dead discussion. Um, while everyone knows that death is a possibility in my games, it's not likely, especially in this game where it's considered a more lighthearted game, but um, it is possible. Everyone is aware of that. We had that discussion at Session Zero that death is possible but unlikely in my games. Um, not unlikely, but it's not something that happens a lot in my games as character deaths. Um, I think in the entire time I've been GMing, I've only had, I can count the number of characters that have flat out died and not come back on one hand. 
Um, but it does happen. So this is one of those encounters where it very well could happen, especially since we're at lower levels. For treasure here, there are two relatively difficult combat encounters happening here. Um, which way does not have any treasure if they... If the party seems like they really want to get some loot out of which way, um, the Revenant may offer them a sword, a plus one sword, just something simple like that. Um, offer them his offer them his blade. Um, the big treasure hordes are going to be with the trolls, who have been waylaying travelers along this road for quite some time now, and of course the black dragon horde remains. So, I really enjoy rolling on DMG tables, and... When I'm homebrewing tie-ins and reworking adventures like this, I always try and find ways that I can work those in. So the trolls are going to have a horde that the players can roll on the 0 to 4 challenge rating table for. Um, there's some cool stuff in there, some basic magic items, and of course a lot of opportunity for treasure and gold and gems and all that good stuff. The black dragon, what the young black dragon guards is going to be a little bit more interesting. Um, I want to use the 5 to 10 in ch challenge rating because if they manage to defeat this black dragon... They manage to defeat it and they decide to try and claim whatever horde it was guarding that should be worth something so we are going to roll in the 5 to 10 encounter table for that but the upper ends of that the 50 plus of that of that uh, table can be super overpowered for a lower level party like this so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut that in half we're gonna have a we're gonna have the players roll a d100 and then we're going to cut that result in half so that means that any result will be below that 50 roll mark and will be within the party's scope of what they should be able to what they should be able to get so yeah it'll be a little bit over what they would normally be getting at this level but worth it for the danger of the encounter they're about to face campaign map hasn't changed that much we still are waiting for them to finish this quest before they get back to the library and then from here from there um, they'll be more likely to be able to start exploring the restricted sections which we hinted at last session which everyone is Ood and Oda and really wants to start getting more involved in Candlekeep itself. So yeah, that's what we've got today. We've got, of course, our music picked out for this session. Uh, we have the Elven Glade for Silvery Moon. A Portal to Heaven um, is what I plan on using for um, which way? Um, Mysterious Grotto is just the general, the one that we're listening to right now, is just the general um, traveling A to B. It's got equal parts adventure, spook, and mystery to it. And then um, the Heart of Portal to Heaven is actually a lot spookier than it sounds. Um, I definitely recommend that anyone that uses Roll20 make use of this library of audio here. It's amazing, the stuff that you can find in this. It's really great, and they're constantly adding to it. It's really good. And of course, I've mentioned before that I do use Monument Studios for my other audio, especially my fight audio. Really great from this. Some of these are really great. And speaking of fight... I still need to pick out a couple fight songs. So, excellent. That is a great reminder that I need to work on that. So, two to three fight songs need to be chosen out. And I think that's it. We are ready to run today's session. This is one of those preps that could very well take considerably more than one session to get through all the content that we prepped. So, next week when we go through this again, you might see some of the same stuff rehashed. But um, that's the great thing about situations like this is... You never really know how far the party is going to get into a session. So you prep as far out as you think they could possibly get. And in this situation, how far they could possibly get is much farther than how far they're likely to get. So hopefully some of this will carry over in the next week as well. But that's all we got for today, everyone. As always, thank you for watching. Have a good one. And if you're watching from YouTube, be sure to check out the Patreon where these videos are posted one full month before they arrive here on YouTube. Links below. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a good one.